I'm talking with Dr. Stephen Levinsky, who wrote the book, How Democracies Die. Welcome. Thanks. And thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. I read your book, and quite frankly, it scared me. You know, I was just, as I'm, as I was reading it, I wondered, was that your intent to sort of scare Americans into acting the appropriate way so their democracy doesn't die? Or did your book just write itself that way because that's how the narrative went? I don't know if we intended to scare people, but um, there was an intent there in the sense that I think all of us, and I definitely include myself, all of us for a very long time took American democracy for granted. I think almost all of us assumed that no matter how recklessly our politicians behaved, um, we couldn't possibly break American democracy. American democracy, we, we believed, was indestructible. And to us, it's becoming clear that that's not the case. It's not, it's not true that, dem that American democracy is dead. It's not true that it's necessarily dying. But there are definite warning signs. And so one of our main intentions was to convince Americans to to stop taking the stability of our democracy well, for granted. Because we all assume that there are protections built into our Constitution, that our democracy is protected. Is that not true? Well, I study Latin America and have for, for three decades. And um, almost every democracy in Latin America borrowed a huge part of its Constitution from the United States. The Argentine Constitution, Argentina, is maybe the Latin American democracy I know best. Its 1853 Constitution was Parts of it were plagiarized from the U.S. Constitution. So they're very, very similar to the U.S. Constitution in their design, but they work very differently. And that, the lesson of that is the rules on paper are never enough to guarantee democracy. The United States has a brilliantly designed Constitution in many ways, but the rules themselves are not enough. Yeah, and I want to get into that a little later. But I did want to ask you, since you mentioned Latin America, because uh, you described democratic breakdowns. And they often don't occur because there's a bloody coup or the president has pulled from office in any violent way. It happens insidiously. Can you describe that? Especially these days. Um, we often, th when we think of democracy dying, we usually think of scenes like either the Spanish Civil War uh, or the, the famous coup in Chile in 1973 when Pinochet seizes power and they bomb the presidential palace and the president is killed. We usually think of general seizing power. And that used to be the, the predominant way that democracies died during the Cold War. But over the last 25 or 30 years, far and away, the most common way in which democracy weakens and in many cases dies is at the hands of elected leaders themselves, elected presidents, elected prime ministers, who often very subtly, sometimes slowly, use democratic institutions to subvert democracy. Now see, that scared me the most mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, I think you call it democratic backsliding, right? So they use the very things in the Constitution to defeat the Constitution. That's like scary. Institu every rule, every institution can be interpreted in different ways and can be used in different ways. And um, one, one thing that became very clear uh, in studying the, some of the, the recent dysfunction of, of American democracy is that very often, if you, it, it's very easy for politicians if they choose, to use the letter of the law in ways that subvert the spirit of the law. Uh, just to give one very simple example, we have the power of, of the president has a power of executive pardon uh, in, the, in the United States in the Constitution. That means that technically the president can pardon anybody he or she wants at any time for any reason. Um, for, throughout American history, that power, that authority has been used sparingly but you can imagine how it can be used in incredibly destructive ways. Well, especially now, right? Right. right? Because people fear if President Trump's um, people um, are convicted of any, any wrongdoing, he'll just pardon them, which he hasn't done no, yet. At, at times, he, has, uh, he seems to have maybe encouraged people to break the law with the, with the implicit or explicit promise that he would later pardon them. But he, he hasn't exploited it as much as he might. Another example, court packing. It is entirely legal. If the president has a majority in Congress, it's entirely legal, entirely constitutional to pass a law that expands the size of the Supreme Court 
from 11 to 20 and allows the president to then fill the nine seats with ideological or partisan allies and therefore tilt the court dramatically in his favor. That is precisely, it's one of the first steps that autocrats in Venezuela, uh, in Hungary, and other places have used to concentrate power, create a court that is completely loyal to you, that, can, that will protect you, that will make sure that no investigation against you goes anywhere, and that can be used to maybe punish rivals. And the beauty of this is people still vote, right? Mm -hmm. So Everything's that, under the U.S. Constitution, is entirely legal. Our, m most of our governments have refrained from doing that, but it's taken restraint, what we call forbearance, to put democratic laws into practice, to, make, to ensure that the rules that, that exist on parchment in the Constitution actually are effective and, uh, and, and democratic in practice. So if politicians don't practice those things anymore, which it's clear they do not, especially forbearance, right? And they also delegitimize, delegitimize their opponents, their democratic opponents, like President Obama was born in Kenya and he's a secret Muslim. And, and that um, resonated with a good number, especially Republicans, right? Because I think polls said 30% of Republicans actually believed that President Obama was not American. Right. So all of that is going on. But what got us to this point? Because America has survived, we survived a civil war intact. But, but what got us to this point where those things are happening um, and politicians are no longer, I don't know, living by those unwritten democratic rules? I think the, it, the, the story begins with partisan polarization. For most of our history, although we've gone through waves, and we had a major wave of polarization before and after the Civil War. So this isn't the first time. But for most of the 20th century, our two parties were in many ways very similar. They were similar in part because they were internally heterogeneous. The Democrats had a conservative wing. Democrats had a liberal wing. The Republicans had a conservative wing. And believe it or not, the Republicans had a liberal wing. Um, and demographically and culturally, until the 1960s and 70s, they were very similar. They were basically both parties who, who, whose leaders and the bulk of their voters were white Christians. And three things have happened in the last 50 years, very quickly. First of all, the civil rights movement led to a massive migration of Southern whites from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, at the same time that African Americans, in many cases, newly enfranchised, become Democrats. Second, massive wave of immigration beginning in the mid-1960s, first from Latin America, then from Asia. Most of those immigrants and their kids are Democrats. And third, a massive shift, beginning with Reagan, of evangelical Christians from, uh, they used to be evenly distributed between the two parties, to the Republican Party. So after 50 years of change, we have a, uh, a party system where the names are the same, Democrats and Republicans, but they represent two really different communities. The Democrats are this weird rainbow coalition of urban educated whites and a range of ethnic minorities. And the Republicans are basically a white Christian party, almost nobody else. And so what? The problem with that very quickly is that white Christians founded this country. White Christians until 50 years ago not only were an overwhelming majority of electorate, but they occupied the top rung of every important hierarchy in this country, political, economic, cultural, social. They held the presidency. They were the senators. They were the Supreme Court justices. They were the governors. They were the CEOs. They were the television newscasters. They were the college professors. They were the faces of both the Democratic and Republican Party. Now, those days are long gone, especially here in California, but they're long gone across the country. However, losing a majority, and in particular, losing one's, dom one's group's dominant social status is a tough thing. It's a, it's a threatening thing. And for many Republicans, so, so it feels like an existential threat. Okay, so it feels like an existential threat. So it's worth undermining democracy? Because there are many ways that you could argue well, the Republican Party is undermining democracy with their policies. But people don't think that way. What, what, that, what that is leading to is polarization. This perception of the many Republican voters, not all of them, many Republican voters, feel like the country that they grew up in 
is being taken away from them. So they view the, the Democrats not just as a party of higher taxes or a party whose foreign policy they disagree with or whose health care prescriptions they disagree with. They see the opposition as a threat to their way of life and which makes them more radicalized as voters and makes them more willing to support politicians uh, who promise not only to end certain policies or to lower taxes, but to um, basically destroy the other side. And so extreme polarization is what leads both voters and politicians to begin to break north. Because when the other side is not just a party whose, ta whose tax policies you disagree with, when the other side is an existential threat, when the other side represents a threat to your way of life, a perceived threat to your way of life, you're not going to um, like politicians on your side mm -hmm. who engage in restraint, in forbearance, in mutual toleration, who get together and hug the, the other side, negotiate with the other side. That's weak. You're right. <laughs> you're going to reward politicians who punch those guys in the gut. Okay, so many Republicans would, if they were listening to this, would say, come on, you're picking on us. You're not blaming the Democrats in any way for the partisanship that exists in our country and for the mess our politics is in right now. Why not? Are you picking on Republicans? Is it well, not any fault of the Democrats? No, clearly it takes two to tango. So the process of norm erosion that's been going on since the late 80s, certainly since the 1990s, is, uh, has an element of reciprocity. So both sides have become very partisan. And both sides have begun to, to challenge norms. But there is a lot of evidence, a lot of empirical evidence that it's an asymmetric process, that Republican voters have shifted dramatically to the right at the same time that Democratic voters have inched to the left but have not moved to, to the same direction. And the kinds of the, 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 what we call constitutional hardball, using the letter of the law to subvert the, the spirit of the law that sort of behavior has been much more egregious on the Republican side. It's not absent on the Democratic side, um, but it's been much more egregious on the Republican side. Can, can you give me an example as far yeah, as voting uh, rights are concerned, for example? I'll get to voting rights mm -hmm. in one second, but the most egregious example in the last decade, I think, has, was the Republican Senate's decision not to allow President Obama to fill the Supreme Court seat uh, created by the death of Justice Scalia. That move, not, not voting down a nominee, but saying we're not even going to consider anybody you put up. You could put Jesus Christ up and we're not going to hold hearings. We're not going to allow you to fill the seat. That has been done before in the United States. The last time it was done was in 1866 in the aftermath of the Civil War. This was unprecedented in the modern United States. Um, at the state level, as you, as you mentioned, uh, in more than a dozen states, Republicans have changed, uh, have, have, have adopted laws that make it harder for people to register and vote. In the case of, um, of Tennessee, they passed a law that a actually p allows the government to, to punish, to, to uh, press charges against voter registration groups that, uh, that make mistakes or that turn in their, their uh, the registration forms too late. So they are using, using the law to actively discourage primarily low-income and non-white voters from voting. That is what we call constitutional hardball. So it's true that both parties do it, but um, the, the evidence suggests that it's overwhelmingly asymmetric. It's being done much more by Republicans. There's a debate now among Democrats about whether Democrats should learn how to fight like Republicans, whether they should do the same thing in response mm -hmm. and not play the sucker, uh, or whether they should continue to engage in forbearance. And you see that. You've seen this since the first day of Trump's presidency on the issue of impeachment. There were some Democrats who wanted to impeach Trump the day he took office. There were uh, Maxine Waters. Oh. Um, that would have been constitutional hardball. The Democratic leadership was incredibly cautious. So why not play that? Because... It, Looking at other crisis-ridden democracies in the world, whether it's Spain and Germany in the 1930s, Brazil and Chile in the 1960s and 70s, uh, Venezuela and Turkey more recently, um, that kind of escalation, that sort of tit-for-tat behavior, where one side uh, plays dirty so the other side responds, 
that almost invariably leads to an escalation that's very difficult to stop. And that kind of escalation almost never ends well. It's very hard to get off the train at some point. So and so we think it would be really dangerous for the Democrats to engage in the same sort of behavior that Republicans have behaved in. So Nancy Pelosi is not acting like a political third grader? Nancy Pelosi, I think, has been incredibly restrained. Uh, despite the fact that the Democratic base has, much of the Democratic base, and the left wing of the party has been clamoring for impeachment since, really since Trump took office, but certainly since the Democrats won a majority in the House, she was incredibly restrained. And in fact, there, I, I think that there would have been no impeachment had it not been for the Ukraine scandal. And so uh, is impeaching Donald Trump at this point constitutional hardball? That's obviously a matter for interpretation. Uh, but the norm in the United States is not never use impeachment. It's not that you never under any circumstance break the glass and use that tool. The norm is impeachment is something that should be very rare, should be used only in extraordinary circumstances, should be used cautiously, with restraint, with deliberation, and if possible, with bipartisan support. I think the Democratic leadership has adhered to that norm. They don't have bipartisan support for it, though. There are three Republican governors today, uh, including my state, Massachusetts, who support uh, an impeachment inqu inquiry. Um, there are important, there are not. The three. <laughs> um, Is that enough? Look, things are incredibly polarized. So if, if in fact, if you required, so to my interpretation of the norm is this, that Democrats must make a good faith effort to build a broad bipartisan coalition. If things are so polarized that Donald Trump could start beheading people at will and Mitch McConnell's still not gonna get on board and Lindsey, Lindsey Graham is still gonna prefer golfing with Trump to, to moving into opposition, then at some point you, you give up the search. Uh, for, for bipartisan support. But um, there are folks in the Senate who have uh, more in private than in public at this point who uh, are okay with impeachment moving forward. There are important Republican voices um, outside of elected office, retired Republicans in particular, who have supported impeachment um, in the media. These are not people with big electoral bases, but they're important Republican figures. And it's incumbent upon the Democrats Democratic leadership to look for that support to build a broader coalition. But I don't think it's insignificant that three Republican governors um, at this point support an impeachment inquiry. I don't think that's a small thing. Well, when you look at Republicans in the Senate, um, it's interesting that they're more upset about Trump's international policies than they are about him possibly using Ukraine to investigate his Democratic rival. Like, it seems that they don't really care about that part of it. But because of what he's done in Turkey and in Syria with the Kurds, that's the ticket for them. What do you make of that? What does that, does it mean anything as far as impeachment is concerned or a, a pending trial in the Senate, which Mitch McConnell's getting ready for? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, my, my guess is um, that Republicans will not, Republicans in the Senate will not abandon Trump until he begins to lose public support. He's been at a, in, an incredibly stable 41-ish percent for most of his presidency. And that 41-ish percent, which includes about 90 percent approval among Republicans, is enough to give him a fighting chance at reelection, and it's enough to make any challenge from within the Republican Party essentially an act of political suicide. As long as that, as those numbers remain the same, 90 percent Republican support, 41% approval rating. Um, I think it's very unlikely that you'll see Republicans do any more than something they've done all along, which is on individual policies say, oh, that's really bad. And then after the news cycle ends, go back to supporting the president. I don't think we've, we've left that world yet. Um, what, do you, what do you think will happen if Trump is reelected? Because you know, I'm living in the state of California where people are I can't even express how psychologically traumatized they are by this president. Like, what do you think will happen? Because he didn't win the majority of Americans' votes, right? He won the Electoral College, yeah. which is quite different. So what do you think might happen? Uh, well, in part, it will depend on the circumstances of his victory. I think if you, it's going to be a very close election no matter what. And so it's entirely possible that he would win again 
without winning the popular vote. Um, and I think that would, which would mean that three of the last six elections, the winner of the presidential election did not win the popular vote. I think that's going to seriously erode the legitimacy of our electoral process, of our democratic system, particularly among young people, among millennials. I mean, millennials have grown up in a world um, in which two of the last three presidents came to the presidency having lost the popular vote. Um, then they also came to, to of age in a world in which the Supreme Court has been, has been essentially packed in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty underhanded way. And we just and like so, activist judges are okay now. So my generation <laughs> mm -hmm. and the older generations still have a lot of faith in American institutions. We grew up in a world in which we, again, took the strength and the value of our institutions for granted. That's not true among millennials for good reason. And I think if Trump were reelected without winning the popular vote again, that would be accelerated. This, this plummeting of legitimacy of our system among young people would, would continue. I am also very, very fearful. I mean, tr Trump would complete his packing of the judiciary and much of the state with loyalists, um, undermining the, the civil service, undermining the, the independence of our institutions. And he would not, if there's, you know, if there's one thing constraining him, um, it's been, you know, when an advisor tells, tells him that this could affect your reelection chances, he occasionally listens to that. And once Trump has the, uh, has the reelection constraint lifted and he's basically a lame duck, he will be even more unconstrained than he's been. So I think another four years, you know, political scientists are not make, good at making predictions, but um, I think he could do considerable damage to our institutions, considerable damage to our position abroad. So, you know, it's just puzzling to me because surely Republicans who supposedly support him see this, see what he's doing to trust in our institutions, sees what he's doing to our democracy. Are they just immoral? Do they not love our country? What is it? To me, that's been the, the, the biggest mystery um, because anyone who talks to Republican leaders, most of them, not all of them, but many Republicans in the Senate, in the House, major Republican figures, talks to them in private, knows that they uh, despise Donald Trump. They do not think he's fit for the office of the presidency. They're terrified by him. They don't like him. They don't agree with most of the things that he's doing, uh, with the exception of the courts and, and taxes and deregulation. Um, and yet in public, they, um, they support him. And that's, that's been true uh, from the primaries, that was true um, with the, the, the scandal of, um, I'm thinking of a term that's probably not appropriate for <laughs> film. <laughs> oh, that? You mean uh, the porn star? Uh, what? <laughs> no, the, oh God. I'm oh, the tape. The tape. Yes, the, the tape. Uh, I forget the name the of the. The P tape, the, right. I forget the name of the, the, the show. The grab the P tape. We'll see, just put it that way. So. What it shows is that they're primarily concerned about re-election because they've learned, they've observed from the campaign, uh, from what happened to Jeff Flake, from what happened to Bob Corker, they've learned that taking on Donald Trump in a frontal way is political suicide. It's the end of your political career. These are people who have, this is their life. It's their livelihood, right? If my, um, if, if my livelihood as a college professor were likely to be ended by a public position I took, I think for seriously. Most of them, it's not their livelihood. They're incredibly wealthy people, in large part, that serve in our Congress. These are folks who want to continue being in politics, so it's and they've power. decided. I couldn't tell you, but they've decided that they're not willing to put that at risk. That's and so cowardly. It is, and I think history won't look. History will frown on them. Um, and, you know, there are other, in, we, we write in the book, there are other periods in history where this has occurred. And sometimes politicians are just not up to the moment. I think many of our politicians are like us. They take American democracy for granted. They think, yes, this is horrible, but Trump's not going to really throw us over a cliff, is he? American democracy is 200 plus years old. We'll survive Trump. It can't be that bad. So I'm not going to, because taking on Trump means 
probably sacrificing uh, an election. Had they opposed Trump in 2016, Hillary Clinton would have won the election. They don't want that. Um, and, and they're still not willing to jeopardize the 2020 election. So they're not willing to take one essentially for the country. Um, now that may be that I'm not. Has that I'm not, always been the case? I'm not. I don't know. Some politicians. I mean, I just wonder. Yeah. It's but just, you know, they, not, they, they talk about being patriots and love of country and love of the military. And there's, they, they paint themselves as these uber patriots. Well, that's why this Ukraine scandal is, is I think, so important. Because um, Trump has shown a pattern now of, tr of trying to undermine our electoral process and, and, and allow and encourage foreign intervention into our electoral process. And that's pretty difficult to defend from a patriotic standpoint, also from a democratic standpoint. And so um, Republicans are increasingly being faced with, the, with, with pretty tough questions. Like, how do you defend this? Are you going to defend this? Are you going to allow this to, uh, are you going to allow Trump to, to get away with this, with um, bringing foreign governments into our electoral process? And I think it's a smart strategy on the part of Democrats to focus on the issue of patriotism, to focus on the issue of, um, is this what's right for the country? I would like to talk about the Democrats because in large part, we're at this point in American politics also because of the Democrats and their lack of a clear message. And they seem to pick the wrong people or support the wrong people who are running for president. Even now, right? You know, you, I watched the debate the other night, and it's just not clear who most of America can support on the Democratic side, right? Because Joe Biden is damaged, and he is damaged by this Ukraine scandal, even though there's no evidence that he did anything wrong. So in that sense, Mr. Trump is won, right? Yes, because Ukraine will be for Joe Biden. Political scientists don't make predictions, but here's a prediction. <laughs> if Biden is a candidate, uh, Ukraine will be Biden's emails. It'll be something that voters don't know what that means. If you ask the average American voter, what did Hillary Clinton do wrong with their emails? Nobody, not one of them can tell you what exactly went wrong, but they know the emails. Ukraine will be the same thing. In that sense, yes, Trump has won. Look, I've got a somewhat different view on the Democrats. Um, I guess a more forgiving view, and that's uh, in, in two senses. First of all, the Democrats are an extraordinarily heterogeneous party. The Republicans, for better or worse, are a party of a shrinking white Christian majority in this country. The Democrats have come to represent everybody else. That is an unbelievably heterogeneous group. That includes AOC in Queens. It includes African-American voters in the South and elsewhere in the country. It includes uh, Latino voters in, in California, in the Southwest, and in Texas, many of whom are socially quite conservative. It includes crazy liberal uh, political science professors. <laughs> it includes Orange County, California. Okay. It includes center-right business people uh, who, are now, who have now defected from the Republican Party. This is an unbelievably diverse coalition. That's good in some ways. Um, it makes taking a clear position really hard. It, it, it's very easy to be coherent and clear when you're as homogeneous as the Republican Party. The Democrats are the opposite of that, and you have to remember that. Nancy Pelosi and, and whoever the Democratic Party candidate is represents an unbelievably heterogeneous group. That makes coher coherent message very difficult. So you will read hundreds, maybe you'll read thousands of newspaper columns of people wringing their hands about how the Democrats can't come up with a coherent message. There's a structural reason for that. It's not that the just the Democrats are dumb. Now, <laughs> they, a, a candidate- I didn't mean to imply they were dumb. I, it's I, just, I, it's, I don't mean to imply that you imply that like, they were dumb. It's just that- um, But it's, it's a tough challenge being a party, being as, as, as diverse a party as the Democrats. Now, the other thing that's going on, you pointed to the primaries. Primaries are double-edged. And this is one of the things we argue in the book, and it's probably the least popular thing that we say in the book. Lots of unpopular things we say in the book. This is the least popular. Um, primaries, we like primaries. They're much more democratic, much more transparent, much more open than the old 
convention system that the United States had prior to 1972. In the old days, party leaders got together essentially in a smoke-filled room and decided who the candidate was. That was, it was not an open process. It was not transparent. It was not democratic. You and I couldn't vote. Uh, there, were, there were primaries, but they didn't mean anything. Right. And so it was the party bosses who decided. Um, that wasn't democratic, but those guys had a perfect record in what we call gatekeeping. They, for whoever they, sometimes they nominated good people, sometimes they nominated mediocre people, sometimes they nominated winners, sometimes they nominated looters, losers. They never nominated a demagogue. They never nominated somebody who was utterly and totally unfit for office because party leaders knew the candidates. They'd worked with them. They'd seen them in action. They knew who was a demagogue and who wasn't. They knew who was fit and who wasn't. And so there, there are advantages to the kind of screening process that the old convention system provided. Voters, we now have a much more democratic process. Great, I love it. I love to vote in primaries, but it's, um, it's a much more open process. And one, we saw in 2016 that demagogues can get through the window mm -hmm. in a way, there, in the old primary system, in, excuse me, the old convention system, there's no way in hell Donald Trump ever would be president today. If we had not adopted primaries, Trump would never be president. The other problem is when you have 16 people or 23 people running for office, almost anything can happen. Um, voters are very strategic. All sorts of idiosyncrasies can happen. Um, and all sorts of uh, near random events can lead us to easily nominate a suboptimal candidate. Um, if, if things, if the stakes are so high as they are today, and things, and the 2020 election is going to be close to a tie no matter what. It's, it's, it's going to be a matter of a few votes here and there. And so the stakes are very high. Who the candidate is could matter a ton. At leaving it up to voters and leaving it up to sort of this, this crazy randomness of, of nearly 20 candidates is, is kind of risky. Uh, there are days I wake up in the morning or sometimes in the middle of the night and wish that party bosses were, were actually deciding the candidate rather than, than voters. Will there come a point in time when, I don't know, the powers that be realize that? The powers that be don't have much power anymore. Who are the powers that be? The powers that be did not want Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. Uh, the, the establishment, the Republican establishment didn't want Donald Trump. The billionaires who fund the, the Republican Party increasingly over the last couple of decades, the Kochs didn't want Trump. The political establishment, the powers that be in the United States, really in democracies across the world, don't have the strength they used to have. They don't have the power they used to have uh, for a bunch of reasons. A lot has to do with, uh, with media and social media, media technologies, the ability to get information from outside the establishment, the ability, as we see with uh, Bernie Sanders and others, to raise money outside of the establishment. The fact that Bernie Sanders could raise as much money as Hillary Clinton in 2016 is revolutionary. So the powers, it's not clear the powers that be have the, have the power to, to, to change things. Um, I would like to focus on the media since I lived through 2016. And, um, <clears throat> you know, a part of me says that the media did play an outsized role in getting President Trump elected, Donald Trump elected president, because we gave him free airtime, yeah. a lot of it. Yeah. And we did it because it was entertaining. And nobody um, in the upper management of my company thought, people would take Donald Trump seriously. Right. That bothers me to this day. It does. Because we did give equal time to Hillary Clinton. So what, how big of a role did the media play in the election of Donald Trump? I think you put it very well. Um, it, it was not, um, it obviously was not on purpose. And it was a product of the role that the media has in the society. The media has a very strange uh, dual role in in our society. It is a really important democratic institution. It provides information to voters, and it provides a check on power. So we rec the media is not uh, written about much in the Constitution, but it is an essential institution of our democracy. Right? We could not sustain our democracy 
without an independent media. So it ha the journalists has, have a role as, uh, as, as preservers of, of protectors of democracy. At the same time, we have a private sector media. We have a media market. The, the media exists not because the Constitution mandates it. Media entities exist to make money. They're profit-making entities. Their job is to make money. They're, and CNN has to compete with Fox and with MSNBC and with a bunch of other entities. There is no way you can tell a private sector actor not to make a buck if it's out there, particularly if somebody the next channel over is going to make that buck if you don't. And so it's as um, as as true as it is what you say that the that Trump's entertainment value is what gave the mass media this powerful incentive to cover him to give this him this extraordinary over a billion dollars by some estimates of free media time, which almost certainly helped him win the presidency. It's totally understandable why it happened, and it's hard to imagine how it wouldn't happen. How do you tell um, CNN not to cover the most entertaining story? Well, you know, the other thing that I wrestle with is, you know, I respect my viewers, and I believe they're, by and large, pretty smart, and they see through things. I do. Mm -hmm. um, so when we would go to these rallies in their entirety, I would think, well, most viewers probably can see right through this, but they couldn't. And I don't know if it's because, like, you know, you hear something so many times, you start to buy into it. Um, and maybe had we broken away and said, oh, this is like crap, right? But we didn't all the time do that. Or is the audience so uninformed that um, we should never trust giving them something in its entirety to digest themselves? Look, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think there are a couple of ways you can interpret what happened. Um, one is what you just spelled out, which is that uh, the media gave Trump a lot of time to sell his message to the American public and a larger number than, we, than, than you thought actually bought it. I have a slightly different view. Um, I think that the, the media coverage of Trump normalized him. Uh, I'm not sure I have an alternative that, that they should have followed, but um, inevitably, our system, our politicians, our media, at the end of the day, treated him like a normal candidate. And that, together with this idea that, or with the fact that so many Americans took our democracy for granted, the fact that having, because we're not Germany, because we're not Spain, because we're not Chile, we haven't lived with a traumatic collapse of democracy. We haven't lived with dictatorship. We haven't lived with the rise of a dangerous uh, demagogue. We all took American democracy for granted. We all figured it can't be that bad. And if CNN is telling us implicitly that he's just one more candidate, he may say some crazy stuff, but he's just one more candidate. He gets a place on the debate stage. The Republicans seem to take him seriously. The media seems to take him seriously. At the end of the day, we normalized him. And, we, and given that we all took American democracy for granted, we said, ah, it can't be that bad. I don't think Americans understood um, how much damage this could potentially do. And I think like, by the time the media realized that, and I'm just not focusing just on CNN because pretty much every network was guilty of this. Sure. Like, okay, so he's normalized because we've given him airtime. And by the time we said, oh my God, this is not normal, and we have to tell people it's not normal, because now you hear that a lot, right? This is not normal, people. It's, it's hard to go back, because what is the viewer to believe when we've normalized him, but now we're saying it's not normal. Right, and we've entered into this level of extreme polarization where people are filtering everything that they hear through a partisan lens, or the number of people who are actually sort of broadly independent, who haven't entirely made up their mind about Donald Trump, uh, and uh, who may be CNN viewers, that, that number of people is, is relatively small. People have made up their mind about Trump, and, um, and they interpret whatever they hear, whether, what it's, whether it's his latest tweet, or what's going on in Ukraine, or his foreign policy, whatever we hear, we just interpret through, through the lens that, that we've already got established. And so the media's coverage doesn't have that much effect. Yeah, um, 
I also want to get into um, Mr. Trump demonizing the media and turning the media into an enemy of the people, which yeah. is another common denominator of autocrats. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, tr the, the, the two things that just about every autocrat, elected autocrat does, is first try to capture what we call the referees, to try to put loyalists, purge and pack the institutions that are responsible for, uh, for, for investigation and justice, courts, uh, FBI, attorney general's offices, et cetera. They all do that, and they all demonize the media. They all go after the, the media. They, um, and it has, look, we have a very powerful independent media. It's not easy for Trump to seriously punish CNN or the Washington Post, um, but, it can affect public opinion. And the, one of the most frightening things of the last few years has been seeing opinion polls that show that a growing number of Americans, and in some polls, a majority of Republican voters, um, support legislation that allows the government to punish media that um, publishes falsehoods. And um, if, if, which gets us a step closer to authoritarianism, right? We, the media is still free in the United States. There's still free speech and freedom of the press in the United States, very high level. But when a big chunk of the American public is willing to entertain laws that allow the government to punish critical media, we're that much closer to authoritarianism. It makes it easier. Trump may not get there, maybe in a second term, maybe not, but it makes it easier for a future autocrat to go after the press. Uh, I'm just curious to hear what you think of this. So Trump is demonizing the media and we're fighting back and it's all coming from a good place, right? But the question is, is how do you fight back against that? Because a lot of people believe in the demonization of the media, right? Because we're so partisan right now. So we have reporters writing books already while Mr. Trump is still in office about um, the battles between correspondents and the president and making money off of it. And um, just personally, that bothers me because it's not the time. For me, unless the media acts extremely professionally and um, facts only, no opinions, not even the appearance of opinions, then the narrative that Mr. Trump is setting out will stick. And I don't think we always do that because we're in a fighting mode. I think, I think that's absolutely right. So this is something that's not specific to the United States. It's very common anytime you get the election of a populist president. Trump is a populist president. Trump came to office promising to take the entire elite, particularly the sort of liberal elite, and punch it in the gut. And a lot of the mainstream media is in that category of, of folks deserving a punch in the gut. And so the media's very strong, uh, very critical reaction to Trump, you're absolutely right. It feeds that narrative, and that's that's sort of a, that's a, an ineb an inevitable dilemma. I mean, there's there's really there's no there's no good strategy for the media and the opposition facing a populist president, right? Either you do nothing and he steamrolls you, or you fight back and you feed the narrative. There really is not. People always say, "Oh, the media is doing the wrong thing." There really isn't a right thing. It's not easy. Um, but at the the Part of what you're alluding to, though, is also part of this dilemma that the, the media has this dual role, right? It's supposed to defend democracy, but it's also supposed to sell, right? And um, this opinion media, media um, you know, my dad loves to watch MSNBC. He loves to watch Rachel Maddow, you know, go on and on about how awful Trump is. There are a lot of Americans who tune in because they want to see Trump trashed on television. That sells. That may not be the best thing for informing citizens. It may not be the best thing for democracy. But MSNBC has to make money as well as defend our democracy. It's got this dual role, and those two things are often in tension with one another. One of your solutions is we must be bold but humble. I found that intriguing. <laughs> That was my co-author's line. Yeah. <laughs> oh, was it really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah he writes all the, the heat. He's a much, really a much like better writer than I am. <laughs> Stop. Well, what does he mean by that? We have to be bold and humble. I wish you'd had him here. 
<laughs> um, I guess that's what, I mean, when, he, when I read this line, I thought of Nancy Pelosi. She's trying to be bold, but humble, but in sort of a cynical way when she says, you know, we must pray for the president. But yeah, it's, well, I think that the we must pray for the president was, was, a, was a political humble. line. I'm not sure how humble That's that was. True. Um, one, of the, one of the meanings of, of that line was that it's, it's really important, and one of the reasons why we wrote the book is it's really important to realize the United States is one country in one case. And we have a tendency in the United States to think, uh, in fact, we use the term all the time, American exceptionalism. Um, which means the United States is incomparable to the rest of the world. There's something special about our origins or about the air or the water. I don't know what it is, but um, in fact, I've, I've gotten in arguments with people, uh, right of center folks interviewing me because I won't endorse this idea of American exceptionalism. Of course, America is different, but the idea, and my, my job is to study comparative politics. My job is to study other countries. The idea that we can't learn from lessons from successes and failures elsewhere in the world is not only ridiculous, but dangerous. So humility in part involves saying, yeah, we should read about what happened in Chile in the 1970s. Yeah, the Chileans may not be as rich as, as we are, and we may not uh, suffer a brutal military dictatorship like the Chileans, uh, but we might be able to learn something from why democracy died in Chile in 1973, or maybe Spain in the 1930s or maybe Turkey, or maybe Venezuela. We need to draw lessons from both the successes and the failures of democracies elsewhere. Um, that, that, to me, was the, probably the most important sort of meaning behind the, this idea of humility. So we need to act, but we can't pretend that we're the only country in the world, or, or we would, we'd be losing an awful lot of information and a lot of insight if we did. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sure. It's been fascinating. Thanks, Thanks Thank for you having so me. so much.